So let us begin. Uh, today we will discuss uh, a new topic. Uh, actually, this is a continuation of the previous topic. Uh, we will discuss uh, multivariate regression. And actually, before we uh, will discuss multivariate regression, let me uh, pose a problem uh, that shows that we really need this tool. Uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, this is problem that is related to uh, to extraction of some causal relationship in data. And uh, let me begin with. Uh, let me begin with example. Uh, assume that uh, I'm interested in uh, some, um, assume that I'm interested in how people learn, um, for example, how they, how they learn to read and I have some data set uh, that consists several uh, several variables regarding again I study some group of uh, group of uh, children and uh, I have something like age and some reading score and some uh, some biometric um, uh, biometric variables like uh, height and weight. And I have something like five years reading score 20, height. Uh, 70, weight 30, age 7 years, reading score 30, height 120, and weight 41, and so on. So mm, I have a table like this. And uh, then uh, let me choose two variables in this table. So one row in this table is one particular one particular kid, and um, uh, we we do all the measurement at the same time. So we have a group of kids, uh, a group of children, and uh, of different ages, and we measure all all these variables um, at the same time. And uh, then we can construct uh, some statistical statistical pictures and um, apply some statistical tools to this data. Uh, for example, I can draw the following picture. Uh, like here is weight and here is reading score. And I have some data points in this picture. Something like this. Yeah. I don't know. Um, numbers are more or less arbitrarily uh, here, so uh, so I have something like this and uh, do we have uh, some correlation in this picture? Can we say that we see some dependency between reading score and weight. Uh, 
and just look at the picture and you can give me an answer. Are there... It looks like we hmm? have a correlation between these two variables. Uh, sorry, can you repeat, please? Um, it looks like we have a correlation between these two variables. Yes, is it positive or negative? It's positive. Yeah, uh, we have uh, we have positive correlation. Uh, between the reading score and weight. So what does it mean that we have positive correlation? It means that if we see uh, if we see a child with large weight, uh, it means that uh, he or she probably uh, will have um, on average uh, will have larger reading score than uh, compared with um, children with low weight, because they are somewhere here. Um, can you believe in this picture? Is it, does it look plausible for you? If we assume that this picture is obtained from this kind of table? Not really. Uh, it not? looks like we... Uh related to variables which are connected with some other factors like um well yeah age. but that's that's yeah, the, that's 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 a, that's, a, that's a good uh that's a good comment but this is this is the next step in our analysis now i just uh i just ask about uh about uh, this picture um uh is it how do you think is it possible to obtain this picture from the real data that we are uh, that we are um, uh, that we are collected in this kind of experiment, I think it is possible because mm -hmm. uh, I think reading score just depends on age, but mm -hmm. uh, height and weight also they depend on on the age. Mm, so, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. If 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 we if, if we discuss uh, if we discuss uh, kids of age like five or seven or ten. Mm, that's uh, that's true. So it is possible. It is possible to obtain this kind of picture, and so it is possible to obtain this positive correlation. And also, we can apply uh, regression analysis to this to this picture, and we can get uh, our uh, straight line that approximates uh, that approximates uh, this dependency. And this straight line uh, will be given by some law, uh, like uh, something like we can apply regression, and we will get something like reading score. Uh, equals to some okay, uh, like. Five plus mm, probably one point two times weight. Uh, these numbers, uh, I just I just obtained these numbers by looking at this picture, uh, and uh, in case if uh, we really had this data, we can just feed this data to R and obtain this uh, as a result of our regression. So I can write uh, something like LM uh, reading score, uh, reading score weight, uh, as you discussed on the previous uh, exercises, and I will update uh, and I will get something like this. So uh, basically we can interpret this value. How can we interpret this value? We can say that this value shows that with each kilogram of weight, uh, we improve uh, our reading score by 1.2, right? If we, if we really believe in this law, and uh, this is what will be given us by uh, some R software or some 
other statistical software, we have to interpret uh, this value like if uh, weight is increased by one, then reading score is increased by one, uh, one dot two. This is exact, exact meaning of this, of this coefficient. Um, well, uh, can you, uh, can we conclude from this, uh, from this regression? Let us believe in this regression for, uh, for a moment. Um, actually, actually, this this regression is plausible, provided this 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 picture. Um, if we really have this picture, uh, then we probably have this this regression, these regression coefficients. And uh, then. Um, uh, then uh, I have to ask a question. Uh, does it mean uh, that um, that a child who uh, wants to increase uh, their reading score? Uh, have to increase their weight. Uh, does it mean that if a particular child, uh, if uh, he or she uh, will increase uh, their weight by uh, one kilogram, that they uh, will increase this reading score by uh, one dot two. Can we uh, can we make such a conclusion from these regression results? How do you think? Maybe from these results, yes, but uh, logically, uh, it seems. Um, uh, that it is not uh, the case. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In fact, uh, in fact, this is uh, this is important uh, example because it shows that uh, interpretation of uh, these regression coefficients and interpretation of correlation uh, in terms of causal relationship uh, is not well. You have to. You know, you cannot just you cannot just interpret it in this way without additional without additional assumptions, and uh, of course uh, in this case this is obvious. This is obvious that uh, if, uh, for example, if I have uh, if I have uh, a child uh, uh, and I want uh, this child to improve their reading score, I I don't have to feed them with uh, very unhealthy food to increase their weight. Uh, uh, it is obvious that this is a good. Uh, uh, this is not a good way uh, to uh, to do it in this case. Uh, we understand that because we understand how causal relationship can um, uh, how this uh, how this ca causal relationship works in reality. We understand that the actual causal relationship. Uh, is not from uh, weight to to reading score. Uh, we understand that uh, the actual picture, just because we understand how 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 kids uh, learn and how they are grow, uh, we understand that um, basically uh, our actual uh, our actual causal relationship is like uh, that. Natalia said that actually age, uh, as age increases, uh, then reading score increases, and also as age increases, uh, height and weight uh, also increases just because just because kids are growing. And basically, if if I want uh, if I want to draw some kind of causal diagrams, I can try um, I can try different diagrams, and uh, one diagram possible. Uh, is like weight uh, causally affects uh, reading score. 
and uh, this this arrow means uh, this arrow means causally affect. So uh, this diagram means that um, weight is a cause of increasing of reading of reading score, and we understand that this diagram is incorrect. We understand it uh, not by looking at the data. Nothing in the data, like in this table, says us uh, that this this arrow is incorrect. At least, at least if we look at this picture only, nothing in nothing on this picture uh, allows us to understand that weight does not affect reading score. We see from this picture that weight and reading score are correlated, but. Uh, how to interpret this correlation? Should we interpret it in causal terms or not? Uh, this is uh, this uh, cannot be obtained from this data. So, uh, but uh, we know that uh, this is incorrect diagram. This is incorrect diagram. Uh, we know it because we know uh, how children grow and learn. And what is correct diagram? How would you, uh, how would you describe correct causal diagram? in this case what what is uh, causal which causal factors uh, work here i have a question yes. i'm not sure that i should ask it now but still uh, is it isn't it true that uh, correlation is never about casualty? So, well, that's a good question, and we will discuss it. We will discuss it. I mean, uh, we like we just describe the data that we have, and it doesn't guarantee us that if our yeah, children yeah. Will be... it 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 usually doesn't guarantee. But if our data are collected with some special precautions then it can show some, some causality. Um, we will discuss it just in, a, in, in a, some minutes. And so are there any ideas on how the correct diagram looks like? Could we make a diagram uh, with uh, the uh, three uh, parameters? Yes, 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 sure, 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 sure. Uh, diagram, actually, this is a very simple diagram that relates only two variables, but you can draw uh, much more complex diagrams with several arrows and several variables, and you can also introduce new variables if you wish. Uh, I just want to use this language of these causal diagrams because it is convenient way to describe which variables affect which in in causal way so we should put h on the h, h. yes let us let us begin with h and uh what affects um what h affects which variables it looks like it affects both um but we are probably more is interested in reading scores. Well, uh, I think uh, that age does not affect the reading score dir directly, but uh, we can say that age affects uh, weight dir directly, more or less. If I don't want to go into details about biology, I can say that age affects weight. And also I can say, for example, actually we don't, we don't have this variable in the table, but I can introduce it. Actually, um, uh, I can introduce a variable like learning time. So how long 
in this uh, particular uh, this particular child learns uh, particularly how long they learns to read for example how many hours during their lifetime or how many days during their lifetime uh, they uh, tried reading so let me specify that this is like how many hours uh, they spent reading and of course uh, the uh, the older you are uh, the more opportunity to read you have and the more opportunity to read you have uh, the best your reading the best your reading abilities and the best and so the larger your reading scope uh, so e e if I want to draw a diagram that looks uh, plausible, I would draw something like this. And uh, in this diagram, we see that it is possible that we have some correlation between weight and reading score. But we also understand that there is no any causal link between them. It is not true that uh, increase of weight uh, leads to increase of reading score. And it is also incorrect to assume the, the, other, uh, the, the other way around. It is not correct that increase of reading score will uh, increase uh, of weight causally. But uh, this diagram explains uh, why uh, it is possible to obtain this uh, correlation like shown on this picture. So basically, to make a good interpretation of regression, uh, of results of regression, you have to keep in mind uh, what causal structure do you have. And uh, sometimes this causal structure is obtained uh, just simply from, uh, from um, some common sense, uh, from uh, theory. In this case, actually this causal diagram incorporates a lot of knowledge about uh, about children, about learning, about growing, about biology, about psychology, and so on. In fact, this, uh, this diagram, it is simple, but it incorporates uh, some rather complex um, picture of how world works. But uh, for us, uh, this, this picture is like a common sense knowledge. When you do uh, more, uh, when you when you are dealing with uh, more uh, complicated examples, uh, it is possible that you don't have these uh, simple common sense diagrams, and you have to have to make some hypothesis. And sometimes you want to test uh, this this hypothesis using data. But uh, the first uh, idea is that it is important. Sometimes uh, that sometimes uh, and actually um, most of the time uh, correlations uh, shouldn't be interpreted just automatically interpreted uh, as a demonstration of some causal relationship. Um, so this is the first the first caveat uh, the first big warning that you can find in any statistical books uh, that causal uh, that uh, correlation does not imply causation something like this and actually this is uh, a kind of negative result because uh, what we are, are usually interested in uh, are these causal relationship so in, in science uh, we usually interested in how things work and um, actually the answer to the question how things work uh, is usually causal we want to what we are really interested in is uh, something like um, what is the reason of this change and uh, how uh, how this change how this change work but anyway uh, sometimes we are happy just with uh, some uh, uh, results of just simple correlations but sometimes we are really interested in, in, in causal analysis and in fact, there are 
several ways uh, to do causal analysis using data. And uh, so let me try to discuss how to extract uh, causal causal links uh, from the data. Um, uh, the short answer is, uh, mm, the short answer is that you can't. Um, the more, uh, the more uh, exact answer is that you can't uh, exact, uh, you, you can't extract causal links uh, from the data alone if you don't uh, control explicitly your experimental settings and if you don't have uh, any causal diagrams uh, that you believe in, it is um, rather difficult to extract these causal links. But uh, sometimes it is possible. And uh, first is to use uh, something like randomized control, uh, randomized uh, control trials. Uh, this is probably not what uh, your will use in linguistic studies, but uh, this is a kind of gold standard of uh, causal analysis. And so let me, uh, let me spend uh, a couple of minutes to discuss it. Um, for example, uh, uh, I believe that the best example of randomized controlled uh, trials are uh, drug studies, uh, drug, uh, drug trials. And uh, how, uh, how are they performed? Um, assume uh, assume uh, for a moment that uh, I have uh, a kind of naive uh, not randomized uh, drug, uh, drug trial. It means that I have a new drug and I just, uh, I assume that uh, this drug allows uh, to cure some disease. Uh, and I just, uh, I just give this drug to hospitals and uh, they try to use this drug to administer this drug to uh, some of uh, the patients. And then they record. Uh, then they record uh, the results. And uh, for example, they have something like. Uh, assume that we know, for example, that new perspective drug uh, is discovered. And uh, this drug is. Uh, it is given to hospitals. And hospitals decide uh, who will receive this drug and who will not receive this drug. And after that, uh, they uh, then uh, hospitals uh, give us data like this, uh, for example. Uh, we have two groups. In one group uh, of patients, uh, they uh, obtained new drug. and uh, disease uh, duration before recover uh, was, uh, for example, seven days. Uh, 
uh, more specifically. Uh, seven days on average. And more specifically, we have the following values. 7.1, 7.2, and something like this. And uh, without new drug, Um, this is duration. Uh, was, for example. Can I ask what does 7.1 7 day mean? Um, um, assume that we have some, some Maybe it is uh, in hours. So like yes, uh, yes. Uh, I assume uh, assume that we have a uh, uh, rather precise way to say that okay, this is is stopped. For example, the exact moment when uh, your body temperature is less than uh, thirty seven degrees uh, Celsius, and then you can measure uh, this disease duration with a good uh, precision, and so you can report numbers like this. Okay. Yeah, okay. And uh, then, for example, without new drug, uh, disease duration is like this. And some, something like this. Assume that we have uh, 100, uh, 100 people here and, uh, and 200 people here. Uh, what can you say about the results of this study? So uh, average here is six. What can you say about uh, results of this study? Can you decide from this study uh, that, can you, uh, can you say something about uh, this new drug? It looks like that it makes uh, things uh, even worse because, mm -hmm. like, uh, for for one day, people uh, people are ill more. Yeah, yeah, it looks just just if if we look at this data, it looks that a uh, new drug is is really bad. Uh, it makes things things worse. But uh, can you imagine uh, a way to obtain this kind of data? Uh, provided that new drug uh, is actually superior to the previous methods of curing of this disease. Is it possible to obtain this kind of data? Uh, even under condition that the new drug is really good. Yes, we could make something like age. For example, mm -hmm. yes. Maybe in first group we have only older people. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. You're you're absolutely correct. In fact, uh, in fact, if uh, if hospitals uh, decide uh, uh, who should receive this drug, uh, then uh, they probably okay. The the, the goal of hospitals uh, is not research. Um, but they, they, they first goal. The first goal is to provide the best, uh, the best possible um, health care to the people who uh, are there, to their patients. And so uh, they probably decide it like, like this. They have uh, some severe cases, for example, cases uh, in, that are related to elderly people and uh, they, they knew that this drug is really perspective, that uh, they assume that this drug is really good. And so they administer this drug to those people who are in worse condition. And, uh, and uh, this drug works really good for these people because 
usually, for example, uh, the disease dur duration for this kind of condition is not seven days, but for example, three weeks. And uh, those people who does not uh, uh, receive this new drug, they are just in a good condition and uh, they just recover quickly just because they are in good condition. So it is possible to obtain this data and it is possible even in case when uh, this new drug is really good. So uh, we, we have to ask, uh, new drug is, is bad or uh, it was given uh, to patients in worse condition. Uh, that's uh, that's the main that's the main question. Uh, so actually, this question uh, uh, this question makes it uh, really uh, difficult to decide: is it true that new drug is good or not? Uh, just by looking at this data. Uh, what should we fix? Uh, how should we change our experiment scheme to be able to judge uh, our drug to test its efficiency? How to change? How to change uh, the uh, scheme of our experiment? We should maybe we should, hmm. I don't know, maybe we should look at the patients in the uh, various uh, conditions and uh, don't uh, give them uh, this uh, new drug so we can compare. Mm, yes, basically you have to you have to compare something comparable. You have to you have to pick patients uh, in the same condition. But the problem is that it is not uh, always clearly how to how can we estimate the condition of the patient? And it is not clear how can we, for example, there are some factors that can affect uh, how our disease, um, how severe this disease and what is the prognosis for this disease. And it is not very, it is not always very clear how to create these groups uh, that are that that represents um, people with uh, more or less the same the same condition. But in fact, it is very simple to create uh, these two groups, and this can be done by randomization. So the answer is the following: uh, assign so to test causal effect of a new drug, uh, we can assign uh, who will get this new drug just randomly by contrasting. And if we assign this randomly, then it means that uh, on average, two groups, a uh, group who obtained the drug and uh, the other group, so-called control group, uh, on average, they will be identical because for any particular patient, uh, the probability to be in either of two groups will be the same randomly like with coin tossing. And if our data are obtained by this procedure, not hospital decide uh, who needs this drug more, but uh, just we do just random random assignment, uh, then we can interpret 
numbers like these ones as an evidence of uh, causal effect of this uh, of this new drug. And this is actually how uh, how uh, drug trials are performed. Uh, in fact, uh, patients are splitted in two groups randomly, and uh, half of them receive drug, and uh, the other half receive a uh, so-called placebo, something that looks like drug, but doesn't work. And then they compare the results. This is how these things uh, are done in, uh, in, in modern times. So um, basically to, to test uh, these causal effects, the best way to do it is to, to make these randomized controlled exp uh, experiments. But uh, the problem is that uh, in most of cases, it is not possible. In fact, it is possible in medicine to some extent because we can uh, get some group of volunteers and we can uh, say them that, okay, you will have 50% uh, probability that you will receive placebo and uh, you, you participate in this uh, study, in this drug study only if you are okay with, with it. So you're, you just volunteer for that. And uh, in this case, it is, uh, it is uh, correct, it is ethical to do this kind of experiments. But uh, in a lot of um, real life situation, uh, we cannot do this, this kind of experiments and we have to uh, do something else. And uh, sometimes uh, we can do something that is close to these randomized control experiments but I do not um, uh, want to discuss this uh, kind of research because it is rather complicated. Actually, it is complicated to find real life situation, uh, some natural situation when we have something like randomized control experiments. But uh, I want to discuss a second, second way to but can I ask about yes. this in medicines? Mm -hmm. So, um, what can happen if all people, uh, if we don't uh, give placebo to someone, if we just give to each volunteer a real drug, how it will uh, de destroy the study? You have to compare. You have to compare uh, people who receive drug with somebody else because otherwise you cannot make any decision. But uh, can't we compare with uh, people who just didn't take anything? Uh, well, uh, it, um, yeah, that's a good question. In fact, uh, in medicine, they use placebo because uh, it is well known, actually there, there is a placebo effect that uh, actually some psychological uh, factors affect how people recover or not. So if you give if you give a person placebo and this person believe that this placebo is actually is actually uh, some, something that will help them, um, it is uh, possible that just by believing they will improve their condition. This is well known effect. And so this placebo is usually used as a kind of baseline. Uh, to which we compare all other all other drugs. So um, mm, this is uh, this is why uh, this uh, this is why people in uh, in medicine they use not just randomized controlled experiments but double blind uh, placebo controlled experiments. Double so blind they mm -hmm. want to uh, test what's the difference between people who receive the real drug and those who just believe that... Uh, uh, yes, yes, basically, uh, basically like this, yes. They, uh, they, have to, they have to compare between the actual, the actual uh, effect of drug like that, that is given by some, uh, by some biochemical mechanisms uh, and they have, to, uh, they have to 
compare this effect with uh, with just pure psychology that uh, that is obtained just by placebo effect. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, and now let me discuss uh, another another way how we can try to extract some causal information from the data. Uh, this can be called uh, adjustment uh, for confounders. And uh, again, I have an example that is also uh, not about linguistics, but more or less about health. But I just want to give you examples that are uh, easy to follow and easy to think about. So uh, nowadays, everybody knows that smoking is bad for your health. But uh, 100 uh, years ago or so, when statistics only began as a scientific discipline, uh, there were uh, very, uh, very, uh, there were debates about uh, the health effects of smoking. And uh, so people created some, uh, actually this was the beginning of statistics and so uh, people began uh, collecting data and basically they can collect data like, like this. Uh, we have uh, on one axis we have smoking level like cigarettes per day. And on other and on other axis uh, we have how to say it uh, length of life, how to say it correctly. Maybe life expectancy. Okay, let us call it life expectancy. And uh, we can probably uh, collect some data so we can follow some people who who smoke and who don't know and who, who don't smoke and we can probably obtain some data like like this and uh, then uh, we can show this data to some people who don't believe that uh, that don't uh, who don't believe that smoking kills that smoke will de decreases your uh, life expectancy, uh, and uh, we can show this uh, this picture for them and and say, see, uh, look, uh, you have negative correlation between life expectancy and smoking level, so you should stop smoking just now, if you want to live longer. And what are possible counter arguments? Our opponent who probably don't want to stop smoking, uh, they can try to, to create some arguments like they can say, okay, this is, just a, this is just a correlation. This is not causation. This is not causal link. And probably uh, actually smoking does not decrease life expectancy. Probably it is not correct that there is a causal link from smoking to life expectancy. And uh, they can uh, provide some alternative explanations. Can you give me an alternative explanation of this picture? Try to be this uh, hardcore smoker who wants to believe that smoking doesn't uh, decrease uh, his life expectancy. And um, what kind of arguments can you provide? Maybe uh, a hardcore smoker could say that, uh, you know, there are car accidents, uh, there are, I don't know, uh, a brick uh, could fall uh, on your head uh, every time. So, uh, uh, well, this, uh, uh, well, bricks, uh, bri uh, bricks, uh, bricks that can fall 
on your head are encoded by this uh, by this variance. You see that even with the same smoking level, there are people who live longer and who live um, who live longer and who live uh, shorter, and so. We see that uh, people are different even with the same smoking level. And so probably uh, this person is hit by uh, some brick and this is why uh, the, uh, this is why uh, uh, his life was so short. But uh, it, this does not uh, it, it, it does not um, it does not uh, provide us a good, explanation of this negative tendency because probability to get a brick uh, on uh, their head uh, it should be independent on the smoking level if we consider it as just a, a kind of uh, absolutely random event so uh, these uh, bricks uh, they uh, do not explain why we have why we have this negative correlation so can you probably, that... mm -hmm, yes Maybe uh, he could say that people who have uh, a lot of stress or mm -hmm. um, diseases, uh, and they tend to smoke more, mm -hmm. but because of the stress and diseases, they just die earlier. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And let me even, actually, let me even introduce an uh, additional variable. Uh, stress is a really good uh, idea, but let me make, uh, picture a bit more complex just to just to get uh, some variable that can be measured easily so but our opponent says that uh, the correct causal diagram is like this uh, so uh, we have stress level and uh, we believe that uh, there is uh, the following uh, variables. First of all, people who are under stress, uh, they smoke a lot. Uh, so this is smoking. And also, for example, they drink alcohol. And uh, this person believes that it is alcohol that kills. So alcohol uh, affects life expectancy, uh, but not smoking. And in this case, if we believe in this diagram, just like we discussed before, we can obtain a picture like this. It is possible that people who have a large level of stress, they smoke a lot and they also consume a lot of alcohol and alcohol kills and smoking does not kill. And in this case, we will have this picture, but we will not have uh, this, this causal relationship. So this, uh, this diagram is compatible with this data. How can we disprove uh, this argument? Assume that we don't believe this argument. How can we disprove it? Only to take into consideration people who do not drink alcohol mm -hmm. or don't drink much alcohol. Yeah, actually we have to compare people who drink the same level of alcohol. And we have to compare how much they smoke. And then we can try to, to draw the picture like this, but only for people with the same level of alcohol. But in fact, it can be not very simple to, it can be not very easy to find a lot of people with the same level of alcohol consumption. So if you say, okay, I, I want only people who don't drink alcohol at all then you decrease uh, the number of people that you can recruit for your research. 
So uh, another way to deal with this problem is to take this alcohol into consideration. I mean that uh, now, let us assume that we have data on this alcohol. So uh, to disprove this argument, Uh, we have to take uh, alcohol into account. Alcohol consumption. Into account. And uh, actually, first of all, we have to uh, collect data on alcohol consumption. So now we have uh, we have data that should be uh, look like the following. Um, like a smoking level. Alcohol level. and uh, life length. Okay, length of life it is called. In fact, it means that we have some historical data, uh, length of life. So for example, we have some medical records and uh, we, we, we know uh, this length of life. It means that we consider only people who already died but we have we have some medical records about these people and we know uh, this information about all of them so for example we have some person who smoked two cigarettes per day and didn't drink and uh, uh, who yeah, died at age uh, 60 and there is another person who lived uh, who, who smoked a lot and uh, drank a lot and uh, who lived 55 years and so on. And uh, then uh, we have to consider the following regression. Uh, so previously we considered only a linear, uh, linear relation between that uh, that took into account the relation between uh, smoking level and length of life. But now I want to consider the relation between, or basically I want to understand how length of life depends both on smoking level and alcohol consumption. So I will consider the following regression. I have length of life. and consider it as a function of two variables. Uh, first of all, I have some intercept. Let me denote, uh, now let me denote these coefficients by betas. Uh, this is uh, Greek letter beta, just because, uh, uh, just because they are denoted in this way, usually in statistical textbooks. Uh, so this is beta naught uh, and this is intercept. And uh, then we have beta that corresponds to smoking. And we multiply it by smoking level. And then uh, we have to add another variable with another coefficient, beta alcohol, that is multiplied by alcohol consumption. So now we have this model. And uh, let us discuss why this model helps us to 
understand uh, actually to disprove uh, to disprove this uh, contra argument. Uh, how it allows us to disprove this uh, this kind of uh, causal diagram. Let us assume that we uh, fitted our data and we get some values here and here. Or even better, let us assume that we know actual values. We know the real dependency between length of life and these variables. And uh, let us assume that we have some, some data. Let me, uh, I want to discuss interpretation of these values. And let me assume that I have something like Assume the real law is the following. Length of life equals to 92 minus two times smoking level and minus three times alcohol consumption level. So uh, actually, uh, let, me, uh, let me assume that smoking level is measured in uh, cigarettes per day. And alcohol consumption is measured in I don't know how to measure alcohol consumption, bottles per day. So how to interpret uh, these three numbers in this case, if we believe in, in, this, in this relation between our variable? First of all, what is 92? This is the longest life time recorded. Mm, it is not necessarily the longest, but what features of, uh, if, if, if we believe in this model, uh, what can we say about people who live um, on average uh, this number of years? Yes, of course it was wrong. Uh, I mean, their uh, smoking level in alcohol consumptions is the lowest. Yes, so they, are, they are zero. So uh, we can say that uh, interpretation of this term here is just uh, life expectancy of people who do not smoke and do not drink alcohol. Uh, so this is life expectancy. of people who do not drink and do not smoke. Okay, uh, what about this number, negative two? So this is our B to smoke. What can you say about uh, this uh, bitter smoke? And that is equal to negative two. How to interpret it? Mm. In case of uh, one cigarette per day, Yes, we measure we measure the smoking level in cigarettes per day. So, yes. what is negative two? Uh, it's a number of years that are taken from this person mm -hmm. if he uh, just smokes one cigarette per day. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, actually, if I want to 
uh, if I want to create uh, some kind of poster uh, about uh, the fact that smoking kills, I can write something like every cigarette, uh, every cigarette uh, per day decreases uh, your life length. The length of life by two years. Again, I write this interpretation just pretending that I really believe in this model. I really believe now that this is actually what happens in reality. And finally, uh, um, And finally, uh, if I uh, interpret this uh, negative three, this value, this is beta alcohol. And uh, this is beta alcohol. If it is negative three, again, this is, uh, this is just like, uh, this is just like a previous example. And we can say that every bottle of alcohol every bottle per day uh, decreases uh, in your length of life uh, by three years. Okay, this is this is interpretation of these coefficients. So this uh, this ninety two it is beta naught or intercept. Everybody agree with this interpretation? Um, but these values uh, ninety two ten uh, ninety two two and uh, three this. Uh, Random or how? Uh, did this we, is uh, just. This is just okay. I I, I just pretend that uh, I know that them somehow. I don't discuss. Uh, I just want to discuss this this model, and uh, I put them uh, more or less arbitrarily, from just just out from my head. Uh, in fact, we will obtain these numbers by analyzing data. Actually, R will give us these numbers, when uh, we will feed uh, the data to. Uh, to R, and they will estimate these values. But now I just want to think about this model. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, let us look uh, more carefully on these on these values. What is important? Uh, actually, uh, let us return to. Uh, let us return to this picture. Uh, let us assume that this, uh, this causal diagram is correct for a second. And if it is correct, then uh, we, we may, uh, the, then we may expect that uh, when people, uh, uh, that if we have a person who smoke a lot, then this person also drink alcohol a lot. So if we return here, we see that, uh, for example, if we compare two persons uh, with different stress levels, then for these two persons, both of these variables uh, will be different. And so both effects, uh, both effects uh, affect uh, our length of life. So basically, uh, let me return to this value negative two. Let me interpret this value in the following way. Let us pick two uh, persons with the same alcohol consumption level. And uh, let us assume that these two persons are different only in their smoking level. Then the difference between their length of life will be exactly two. So, 
uh, precise interpretation of coefficient. Uh, precise interpretation is the following. Uh, compare life expectancy of two people so uh, for person one we have uh, some so Uh, of two people who are different uh, by one in their uh, smoking level. Uh, but have the same alcohol consumption level. Uh, then uh, the difference between uh, their life expectancy uh, is negative two. Uh, who smoke? Uh, who smoke one cigarette more? Uh, live two years less and uh, provided uh, this is provided the same level of alcohol consumption. Uh, so, uh, let us look at this interpretation. Uh, everybody agrees that this interpretation uh, is correct, provided that we believe in this formula. That uh, this value negative 2 shows how uh, this variable changes as we change, uh, we increase uh, this variable by 1, but keep this variable fixed. So if this variable is fixed, then this term does not change at all. And what changes uh, is only this term, and this ch and this term changes like if I increase this by one, then uh, this thing is decreased by two. And this is what uh, I get here. So let us look uh, a bit at this interpretation. And uh, so this is this is actually a crucial idea here, because if we have data on smoking and on alcohol consumption, and you have this model, and you fit your model to the data, and you obtain these uh, estimates for these coefficients, then uh, if you see that uh, these estimates. Um, for example, we, we see that uh, indeed we have something non-zero here, something negative here. It means that we already took into account uh, this. Actually, in this model, we already took into account this alcohol consumption level. So uh, if we, if um, what I want to say is the following. Uh, if there is no effect, if uh, 
uh, our correlation between life length Uh, and smoking were explained by so uh, if uh, the correlation that we obtained here at, at this picture if this correlation uh, were due to uh, due to this picture then uh, what would we get uh, here at this data. We would see in this case that alcohol consumption level decreases length of life, but uh, this beta will be close to zero. This will be indistinguishable from zero because these uh, this coefficient measures how uh, people are different in, this, in, the, in their length of life, depending on smoking level uh, provided that alcohol consumption is fixed, it's the same. And uh, so, uh, if, uh, if in fact uh, this correlation were explained by alcohol, uh, then we would get beta smoke indistinguishable from zero. actually statistically insignificant. So uh, actually, uh, do you believe in this statement? Are there any question about this statement? Mm. Don't we need the word like only here? Hmm? Our, don't we need uh, like uh, a word only in this different statement? Like if our correlation between life length and smoking. Mm, okay, yeah, uh, I agree by alcohol only. Yeah, let us add, let us add in this by alcohol only, I agree. Exactly. Because it can be partly explained by alcohol and partly by smoking. Or it can be explained partly by alcohol, partly by smoking, and partly by some other factors that uh, we don't take into account in this study. But um, yeah, in this, in this form, everybody agree with this, uh, with this idea. So uh, let me reiterate it uh, once more. If I have this model, uh, then uh, this coefficient, uh, this coefficient beta smoke, uh, shows uh, how uh, how length of life uh, of people different when they are different in their smoking level, provided that alcohol consumption level is fixed. If uh, both smoking level and alcohol consumption level are different between these two people, then we have to take into account this coefficient and this coefficient and calculate uh, the difference uh, between their length of life according to this formula. But if we fix this alcohol consumption level at any level and you look uh, and, uh, and you change the smoking level, then uh, we have only this uh, only this dependency, and it means that this variable uh, catches the effect of smoking level only. 
So this is actually, this allows us to do something like, something like compare only groups that have the same alcohol consumption level. It would be hard to do that, to find uh, precisely such people. Uh, yes, and we don't. And uh, the idea is that we don't need uh, to find people who have precisely identical uh, alcohol consumption level, because this uh, this thing, this multivariate regression, gives uh, gives the answer for us. It takes into account this effect of alcohol consumption, and allows us to split between two effects, effect of smoking and effect of alcohol. And after we have this splitting, we can, uh, we can return to our initial question and uh, say, okay, assume that we do our data analysis and we get, uh, we get this coefficient and it is significant. Uh, then uh, we can say, okay, you see, uh, we can say to our opponent that this, uh, this argument is disproved because this argument assumes that if we fix this alcohol level, then uh, life expectancy shouldn't depend on smoking. There shouldn't be any correlation between life expectancy and smoking. But if we still have we still have some uh, negative coefficient there that is distinguishable from zero, that is statistically significant, uh, then it means that this uh, picture, that this uh, causal diagram cannot, cannot hold in reality. And uh, this is the idea of how can we, how can we uh, disprove this kind of Contra arguments. Actually, this is not an end of story because after we disprove this alcohol argument, our opponent can give us another argument. For example, they can say that, okay, this is not alcohol, but this is, for example, bad food. And probably uh, we have something more, something different like stress, uh, smoking, uh, bad food and life expectancy. Uh, then uh, to take into account this bad food uh, variable, we have to collect data about, uh, about rations, about food that those people um, get during their lifetime and make adjustment for this, for this food variable. So to include this new variable into your regression, and then again, either show that you still have effect of smoking or say, okay, we don't know. But basically this uh, is what can be done uh, sometimes uh, when you can collect data um, uh, on different variables that can confound your uh, your correlation that can be alternative explanation of your correlations. And uh, this is uh, what people usually do when they want to extract uh, some causal relationship but cannot uh, but uh, cannot do strict uh, randomized control trial. So uh, this is why we need, multiple regressions, regressions with multiple, multiple variables. Actually, this is not the only application of this multiple uh, uh, multivariate regressions. Uh, this is actually a natural idea to assume that the variable of interest depend not only on one variable, but on several variables and to consider the effect of each variable. And uh, the beauty of this regression is that it gives you uh, the results of each, of each variable independently on uh, other variable. So it gives you these coefficients that gives you information about the effect of a particular variable uh, on, the, on this variable, on the 
actually these variable are called uh, independent variables and this is also independent variable and this is dependent variable so uh, and this multiple regression allows you to give uh, these estimates for coefficients for that measures effect of each independent variable that it uh, gives to this dependent variable and uh, of course it is used not only in this kind of research but in other research as well so basically uh, what you are expected to do in your final projects is also to consider some multivariate models like like this regression or other kind of regressions that we will discuss later okay and uh, i think that uh, that's all that i wanted to discuss today at the lecture are there are any questions This uh, method is only applied to the data that will give us a kind of linear function. Right? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Actually, everything that uh, we discussed so far is devoted to linear dependency, and linear dependency basically it is a good first approximation. Of course, we understand that the actual dependency can be not linear. Uh, but it is a good uh, a good first approximation if we are interested only in a question uh, like uh, uh, how this variable will change on average if I increase another variable by one then we assume that we have something that is close to linear relationship of course it is possible that your relationship can be something different like this or something like this and of course, sometimes uh, linear or linear models are not applicable. And uh, this can be um, overcome by different ways. One way, for example, is to uh, is to uh, do some pre-processing and transform your variables. For example, if you have a relation that looks like this, then probably instead of taking this variable, for example, this can be vocabulary size and this can be age. It is possible that vocabulary size growth uh, with age um, non-linearly much faster than linear. And probably in this case, you will get, uh, you will use logarithm of vocabulary size instead of just vocabulary size. So probably you will get something like something like this. So uh, you can consider a logarithmic scale in this case. Sometimes uh, you have to just uh, consider different models, uh, maybe models that have some nonlinear terms. But uh, this is not very, uh, this, is, uh, this is rather rare, but sometimes this can happen. But basically, your linear regression is a very good first approximation because usually uh, the relation that we are working with are, at least they are usually monotonic or we can expect them to be monotonic. So the larger, the larger, the larger age, the larger vocabulary size, something like this. And if you want to study these monotonic relations and then at the first approximations, you can, you can think that they are linear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, then we can make a 10 minutes break now and then continue at exercises and consider multiple regressions in R and their interpretations. Everyone. Oh, hi, Ivan. Okay, so 10 minutes break, right?
Okay. And then goodbye, everybody. Bye.
Ничего, у меня сейчас появился перерыв, но просто хочу подготовиться. Хорошо, спасибо большое. А ты через сколько будешь? А, хорошо. Супер, супер, ладно. Угу. Давай, пока.
Hi everyone. How are you? Do you hear me? Do you see me? Yes. Yes, yes that's cool. you. Okay, so let's start. We will do a multiple linear regression today. So actually not something uh, really, that's not really more complicated than just simple linear regression. So we have not one predictor, but more predictors. We have some complications because of that. And we'll talk about that a, li a, a little bit. So they will work with a, uh, with a data set on uh, with psycholinguistic data, uh, data from some psycholinguistic experiment. So experiment is, some, is a method of study when you manipulate something and get something in return, measure some variable, dependent variable, and you control independent variable. So what is the independent variable and dependent variable in this experiment? Because if you understand what is independent uh, variable, the independent variable in the experiment, so what you try to manipulate and want, what you measure that supposed to be changed uh, if you manipulate independent variable. So um, uh, let's have a look. Let's upload first uh, wait, I'm sorry. Let's upload tidyverse. And we use this data set. I hope everything is okay. Uh, so could you tell me how can we explore this object? that we uploaded, that we imported. Any ideas what to do? I mean, you have a new data set and you don't know anything about that. Like, uh, I don't know, your empl uh, employer said, uh, said like, uh, I have a data for you and you need to do something with it. So what, you, uh, what will be your first moves to for this data set? Maybe to ask for summary. Yep. Okay. Let's try. I mean, it is not a question with a correct answer. You know, uh, there are just I don't know. It's just a skill of some exploration uh, of exploratory data analysis that you just apply. You you have set of tools. Uh, for example, basic uh, function summary in base R, that is a generic function, meaning that if you apply it to different um, classes of data, uh, you get different results. In this case, you have uh, summary statistics for every column. Okay, seems pretty much, I mean, yeah, you can explore it, but it's pretty difficult, I think. So first thing, yeah, if the data set is not so big, yeah, you can see that it's not really big. Just, I mean, 5,000 uh, rows, it's not 15 million rows. Uh, you can just uh, press it and explore columns and uh, rows that you have there. You have really many of them. And of course we do not will not use all of them. Just let's explore the most important, uh, the most interesting. Uh, first of all, H subject. Is, interestingly, it, it is coded as uh, young or I don't know what, what is not young. Uh, let's check. Uh, let's use count on uh, H subject. Okay. Half of them are young and half of them are old. Hmm. It's pretty interesting, you know, uh, that it's exactly the same number. Uh, usually it's a sign of some late data, but uh, well, because in reality, you don't have like uh, uh, exact, exact sizes uh, of uh, groups and it's pretty much okay. Uh, okay, so it's either old or young. Okay. Uh, word uh, category. 
Let's, let's explore what we have in word category. Count. What is my mistake? Why I have this error? You just misspelled the data frame. Yes, yes, exactly. Just a typo. But you know, in reality, you will do many such mistakes actually. So it's pretty okay. It, it was not intentional. Of course, it, it, it's easy to, to find out that it's just a typo. Uh, usually it says like object something is not found. And the first thought should be like, uh, well, is it written correctly or not? Okay, uh, what do we have else? Um, so N means noun, V means stands for verb. Okay. Uh, and what are the, uh, what are the, uh, uh, dependent variable is, uh, is reaction time for, uh, it's actually not reaction time, but I think it's logarithmized reaction time. So just, uh, Usually, reaction times when you do some experimental task for making. Uh, in, in this case, you need to do lexical decision on whether this verb, uh, this word, is real or it is a pseudo word. For example, uh, while or draw are real words, but pro, I think it's fake word. So it's like pseudo word. I think you know this stuff about pseudo words that are used in psycholinguistics experiments or neurolinguistic experiments when you try to compare reaction of your brain or uh, um, some behavioral differences on uh, real words and a combination of letters that remind you that it is a word, but it has, not, has no real meaning. Like if it uh, if you if I use just a random uh, sequence of letters, uh, it will be clearly for you that it is not a word, and uh, that's why uh, linguistic researchers uh, try to mimic real words with pseudo words that looks like a word but has no real meaning. And you need to decide whether you have a real word or not. And uh, uh, then it's just a recorded reaction time for this decision making. Uh, and another column is a, a reaction time for naming the word. Uh, so uh, you need to uh, pronounce the word that you see. So just, uh, you, you see the word, you, you say like base, zone, or face, uh, and just a reaction time on this test. Uh, I think it's logarithmized reaction time because usually reaction time for a simple task, it's not longer than one second. It's just like, uh, very minimal uh, is something like 100 milliseconds, but it's for like very easy tasks for de detection of light. Uh, you know, if you if uh, if you're a professional runner and you run sprint uh, and you use like very short distance, and if you start um, after firing a gun in less than 100 milliseconds after the start, uh, it's uh, still counted as a false start because you cannot, you cannot react 
faster than 100 milliseconds. Okay, so, uh, and also other, uh, other parameters like uh, length of the word, length in letters. So just a uh, length of uh, the word, like sketch and has length six, pretty logical. Uh, Yeah. And uh, I have a question. Why do you okay. think that uh, there are words that are not real? I think all, all these words are real, but... Yeah, maybe, okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, I, I don't know, um, uh, so... Okay, okay, uh, um, yeah, maybe this word are real. Okay, maybe there is another word category. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Um, So here you have uh, the data set actually. You can even download it with a, uh, uh, with a package uh, language R. If you have this package, uh, if you don't have, you can just install packages language R. And uh, this is a, this package contains this uh, data set and you can get a more uh, detailed descriptions for every, uh, for every uh, column in the data set. Numeric vector with log morphological family size and so on. Okay, so we can even take some uh, written frequency. What is written frequency? Number of frequency. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, uh, written frequency is just the frequency of the word. Uh, maybe we have only real words in this case. I'm not sure because I don't see a variable that says that it is real or not real word. But yeah, and um, we'll take some variables. Uh, let's see. First, let's uh, just uh, filter the data a bit and let's take only uh, young subjects and uh, only noun verbs so we'll exclude uh, verbs how we can do that how can we do that do you remember you can filter them out yep exactly filter and then h subject simple signs young and uh Word category cool, and then we can select just several uh, columns. For example, uh, what is the function to select columns? Do you remember from from a table? How to just select? Select, right. Select. Uh, let's take uh, RT let's deck. Let's say we can we can see. Uh, let's say linking letters. And 
And there's also some family size number size. Okay, we can we can just uh, use it use only this for now, and then we can do more complicated uh, model if you want. Uh, let's save it as. Um, or ink filtered or ink small, ink subset. Okay. Uh, let's explore this subset with a steamer function from the package. Steamer. Do you remember this package? It's really nice package that just show you some uh, um, table with exploratory results, but it's rare. Okay, okay. Uh, you can get some summary uh, statistics for different columns. In this case, you can see that you have no missing values. Uh, complete rate is uh, one, meaning that there are no MAs. Uh, you have mean and uh, standard deviation for every column, and also uh, percentiles. Zero percentile, 25 percentile, uh, 50 percentile, 75 percentile, and 100 percentile. Do you remember what is the percentile? What, what does percentile mean? The percentile shows us where the twenty-five percent of our data data lies, yes. and seventy-five also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, fifth uh, uh, percentile fifty means that it's just uh, the middle of the distribution, and uh, this value, uh, uh, half of values in the data set are lower than this, uh, this value. And half of uh, the data set are higher than this value. Uh, and also, do you know other words for P50? Major. Right, correct. So actually, uh, uh, percentile 50, it's the same uh, as median, because median just split your um, uh, sample by two, and uh, P25 and P75. Mm. I'm not sure they have special names. Uh, no, they have, they have, uh, they're called quartiles. So quartiles, uh, just three dots uh, or yeah. intervals uh, that divide the whole sample. So for example, uh, quart uh, quartile one or Q1 means that uh, it is a, val uh, it is a uh, uh, value that uh, divides the first 25% of value, the lowest 25% of value, uh, it separate uh, separates it to another uh, to, to the rest of the sample to the rest seventy five percent. For example, in uh, bibli uh, bibliometry, uh, in uh, scientometrics, uh, you have these portals to measure quality of journals. So you uh, rank all uh, scientific journals in some database by some um, rule, for example, by impact factor. So like the higher, the more, the more popular scientific journal, the more cited the uh, scientific journal is, the higher it has impact factor. And uh, the top 25% of uh, uh, scientific journals are called Q1. And if you publish in Q1, you're a really cool guy. Uh, 
uh, the lowest 25% uh, uh, of scientific journals are Q4, Q4, meaning that uh, they're like the worst 25% of journals. And it's like, usually it's a more uh, uh, welcome by uh, universities, if you published, if you are published in uh, co one, then in co two, and then co three, and then co four. So, uh, and what do you think stands for? Uh, what what do you think P zero and P one hundred stands for? You no, know, just the whole data set. Uh, just minimum and maximum value of the data set. So just another word for the mean. So it just uh, looks really nice, but actually just minimum value, Q1, median, Q3, and maximum value. Uh, pretty similar to what you get if you do summary on on, on something. Subset. So let's do it for vector, and you can see minimum value. Uh, first quartile, Q1, P20 or P25, median, uh, third quartile, and maximum value. Actually, more or less the same, with less numbers. And you don't have a mean because, you know, you have mean here. It's a bit different compared to uh, minimal value, uh, first quartile, uh, median, the, uh, uh, third quartile, and maximum value. Because all this way, all the statistics except for mean, they're all about rank of the, you know, of the value in the data set. Uh, so all about ranks. And uh, so it's all about ranks, except for arithmetic mean. Uh, okay. Uh, and now let's uh, let's do some simple model. Uh, do you remember how how can we do uh, linear regression in R? What do we need? Do we need for that? You should write LM. Yes, exactly, LM. And let's do some very simple model. Uh, I mean, simple linear regression first. Uh, so the first argument is a formula where you say like RT, dex, dex, and uh, then you put tilde. Uh, if you forgot uh, where this tilde comes from, you you can find uh, the tilde uh, in the left upper uh, corner of your keyboard, most likely uh, where you have a button yo. Uh, and to the right uh, side of the tilde, you put uh, like some predictor. Uh, let's think about predictors and what hypothesis we can generate here. I mean, in theory, like linguistically. Or you can even use other uh, variables to not only these two variables, actually. Um, and what does this uh, at C Lex Dex uh, Lex Dex uh, show us? What is uh, this variable about? Sorry. What, you, uh, what uh, this at C Lex Dex variable is about? So ah, Lex Dex variable is uh, uh, logarithmized reaction time on visual lexical decision when you need to decide whether the word is real or not. 
So you need to do some decision on meaning of the word. And why it is uh, logo uh, or, or is nice? Um, it's actually interesting question because um, we can talk about that in details and uh, 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 because it's actually quite tricky topic uh, and it's uh, quite debatable. Uh, so um, actually uh, all things about a linear regression, they works perfectly when you have uh, uh, normal data. I mean, when your data follows normal distribution. But it's actually a bit oversimplification that you can find in different textbooks. What is really important is uh, that uh, residuals in your uh, model are normally distributed. So not real like uh, dependent variable, but uh, residuals of your model. Remember, you you have residuals that is something that you didn't explain by your model. And uh, there is an assumption for linear regression that uh, residuals must be normal. Otherwise, the model will be in invalid. But actually, it's a bit difficult and a uh, question because actually, when you, okay, it's easy to say like, okay, uh, my data do not follow normal distribution, my residuals do not follow uh, for, uh, normal distribution. And that's why I, I cannot use linear regression. But what will you do instead? That's the question. Uh, because, and uh, when, when you say that, okay, your uh, model will be not valid if you apply it on, uh, on the data set and if your model have, uh, if your model has uh, no normal uh, residuals, your, your model will be somewhat not valid. But how much this invalidity will be? And in practice, it's usually not that really much. Um, and you can apply uh, linear models on not only on perfectly uh, normal data. Uh, but anyway, uh, there is a like ways to, to uh, go beyond simple linear regression. And uh, for example, uh, if you have uh, your variable, your, uh, your dependent variable is binary, you just, you just can't apply linear model because uh, your residuals will be, your residuals will never be uh, linear. And in this case, it is not, you have a better method for that case. You have a logistic, a logistic regression uh, that fits this uh, data better. So you, if you have, if you, your, uh, uh, if you find out that uh, distribution of your uh, residuals is not normal, you can try to do some different model, not linear model, but some a bit more complicated model but they are all based actually on linear models. Another option is to go to non-parametric methods that we already discussed. Uh, there are usually no such alternative for complicated uh, uh, linear models with many predictors. Uh, so if, if you have multiple linear regressions, hard to find something, uh, some relevant non-parametric uh, alternative. And the third option, the first is to moving to more complicated models. The second is to using uh, is using non uh, parametric alternatives, and the third one is actually uh, transforming your data. So just take your data set, take take your uh, variable, and just apply some function on that to make it normal. 
For example, uh, the very simple way to, to, to do that is, is to apply uh, logarithmical transformation, uh, especially if you deal with reaction times. Uh, because reaction times, it, you can even try to find, uh, uh, you can even try to find uh, time distribution. Uh, let's have a look on, on that. Reaction times. So, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, I think it's this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this picture is from some real data, it, at, at least it seems so. So you have something like a peak in the beginning and then you have slowly coming down. Uh, reaction time cannot be lower than zero, but it can be, it has no upper limit actually. So sometimes, uh, participant just sit uh, in front of the monitor and that's all uh, and because they I know they have some uh, blinking their attention they want to check this some the smartphone or whatever and that's why some reaction times are really bigger than other or they have really complicated uh, decision and they think about that for several seconds and uh, some people just delete these outliers. For example, you can just say, ah, it's the force actually uh, uh, method, but uh, I don't think it's a good way to do that. So you can just uh, delete all reaction times that are higher than let's say uh, 3000 uh, milliseconds, so three seconds, right? Uh, but what is interesting that if you apply logarithmical transformation on reaction time, you will get almost perfectly normal uh, curve in your data. So even your very extreme outliers will be just somewhere in their tail on the distribution, but not that much uh, uh, far from the center of the, of the distribution. Uh, actually, it doesn't mean that reaction time has log normal distribution, but it can be approximated with log normal distribution. And if you uh, if you uh, apply logarithmical transformation, you will get almost normal. Uh, dist normally distributed uh, variable uh, if you apply it, uh, logarithmical transformation for reaction times. Of course, uh, of course, it also depends on the tasks because decision making tasks they usually are more uh, more skewed than uh, simple reaction task. Uh, for example, you have a light and you just need to press a, but a button. You don't need to think, you just need to press a button as soon as possible. If you have some more complicated decision making, for example, you need to decide on your choices, whether you prefer Pepsi or Coca-Cola or whatever, or you just need to compare to personal statements. Uh, in these cases, reaction time will be much more skewed than for simple reaction time. Let's have a look how it looks here. Ink subset over pump. Look, right? Uh, it's not perfectly normal, right? Uh, but uh, it's uh, pretty common uh, actually thing uh, that you have for decision making, you have a uh, very skewed distribution. And even after uh, you apply logarithm transformation, you get the skewed distribution. Actually, there is also more uh, 
you know, uh, general way to solve this problem. So if you want to just transform your data to normal, there are actually additional ways, uh, more complicated ways to do that. Uh, for example, very popular one is box Cox transformation. Uh, I will not show it for now, uh, but uh, because first I want to develop a package that do that does it simpler, more, more simple than it, 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 it than uh, it is uh, implemented now in R. Uh, but basically, you just apply many transformation to your data. And just select uh, select uh, the transformation that makes your data uh, looks normal. Uh, that's the logic of uh, all uh, transformation functions like uh, QT transformation, or box scope tr transformation, or the most popular for now is the uh, Yao J uh, Johnson transformation. The logic, uh, the logic uh, everywhere is the same. I want to check whether we uh, refmized. Okay, not subset, but RT naming. I think RT naming will be less cute. Oh, it's even by model. We have very, uh, you have just to normal distribution there, meaning that there is some real, uh, um, some real factor that influences uh, binary usually, usually factor that influences these two, uh, uh, this variable and it makes this look, uh, look like uh, two uh, peaks. But uh, actually, in reality, even if you have really uh, serious factor with high effect size, usually you don't see uh, something like that. It's usually really su surprising if you have if you see so such clear effect. Usually, it, uh, something like a flat on the uh, top of the curve. Uh, and this flatness, me, uh, flatness means that it's, it's something like combination of two uh, normal distributions. For example, uh, you can have a look on uh, distribution of hates, a distribution, and it's sometimes used as an example of normal distribution, but actually it's not normal. Uh, because you really have really high differences between males and females. Uh, also, there are some other differences, for example, race, uh, age. Uh, so there are other factors, but uh, I think uh, the factor of uh, gender is a more is the, is the more is the most clear uh, factor. And you can see how it looks like in real life. So um, in reality, oh, it's a bit strange. No, I don't like this picture. They're just one over another. I want to see uh, the stacked one on another. Uh, okay. Hmm. I thought that Google is full of these pictures, but no. Um, okay, so if you just stack these values one to each other, let's see this one. Uh, if you stack two distribution one to another, you will get something like a, you even see, you, you, you can even see it here. You have something like a flat line in the top of the distribution because it's a combination of the distribution. You don't really see real peaks, different peaks. Uh, you have something like a flatness on the top. Okay, so let's start and do some model. 
So what we'll use as a predictor here? Do you have any ideas? Let's start with some very simple predictor, whatever. Just give me some hypothesis that we can test. This reaction time, it is, um, could be connected with uh, the length of the word. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and could you explain in more details uh, uh, how do you expect this connection to be animal, and why? So, uh, my my hypothesis is uh, that if a word is uh, very short, for example, I don't know, up, mm -hmm. uh, it would be uh, the reaction time would be um, small, and if uh, it is uh, a word like I don't know, phil uh, philosophy, so uh, the long word, so reaction time would be very high. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, it's pretty similar. We, we, uh, first of all, I, I think there, uh, I mean, we, we know better short words and it's faster to read them and to expect that uh, for uh, shorter words, uh, reaction time will be shorter. That's all. And let's do a linear regression and we get some uh, error. Why do you think we have this error? It's more complicated than the previous one. You didn't specify the source of the data. Exactly, right. Data to ink subset. Uh, yeah, so you have some intercept and you have some value. Uh, yeah, the problem with logarithmical uh, transformation that actually it's pretty okay to apply to a data. The problem is that uh, it's harder to interpret. So uh, if you have uh, uh, this regression line now, you cannot say that like every uh, additional letter in the word uh, gives you like uh, 100 more milliseconds. Now it's like one additional letter in the word at some logarithmized change. It's harder to think about that. You can think about that, but it's harder. So if you apply logarithmical uh, transformation, it's uh, just, you lose some interpretability of the model. Uh, okay, and let's use summary on that to see this result. So, yeah, it is significant. And yes, the longer uh, the longer uh, the word, longer reaction time. Uh, at least that we can see from estimate. How can we interpret this model, whether it's significant or not? Uh, what about effect size? And can you elaborate for me? What, what do we have here? This is also, of course, significant. Mm -hmm. Why? Because uh, P uh, is smaller than the usual yeah. threshold. It's smaller than uh, zero point. Uh, which, which P actually? Because actually we have many P's here. Um, P yeah, are... All of them significant. Which one? In, in, the, in the bottom, right? Um, yes, yeah. I, I thought, uh, actually I was thinking about the one in the table, like PR. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. This yeah, is... actually with one predictor, uh, if you have one predictor, this p-value and this p-value, they're basically the same. Oh yeah. I mean, always, if you have one predictor. Uh, do you remember uh, what is this p-value means? 
and no. Maybe it somehow estimates our model, our model. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this p-value is about intercept. So remember that linear regression is a line. And line, you can, uh, uh, straight line, you can, uh, uh, you have formulas for straight line to describe the whole straight line. It means AX plus B. Uh, and X is your X. A is your coefficient for slope. Uh, in this case, it's length, uh, it's a coefficient for uh, length and letter, this one, 0 0.008 and something. And intercept is B or B0 in linear regression uh, terms. Uh, uh, it is a, like, a, mm, it's a value of a, uh, y when uh, x is zero. So if you have, uh, it's hard to interpret it in this case, I mean, it's impossible to interpret it in this case because we don't have words with zero letters. So it's interpretation is meaningless there. Uh, but sometimes it's not mean, uh, meaningless. Uh, and uh, uh, for when X is equal to zero, you get some value. It's not necessary uh, zero. Uh, and in this case, it was estimated that for uh, that uh, this value is six dot four and something. Uh, so, so what does this uh, p value says? It says that yeah, it's uh, it will be very surprising to get uh, uh, this estimate of uh, uh, this estimate intercept uh, if our null hypothesis is true and null hypothesis for this p value is that intercept is zero. So for uh, like uh, if you have no letters your reaction times is zero. So it, so the line crosses zero zero dot. But uh, we usually are not interested in that because I mean they are not interested. I mean, it doesn't matter for us. What we are really interested in is uh, whether X somehow can influence Y. Uh, and please remember that X influences of X on Y are just some statistical terms. It doesn't mean that they are really causally connected. So we basically talk about associations, but still uh, we are interested in how X and Y is connected. Whether Y is higher, if X is higher, or maybe it's lower when X is higher, or maybe it doesn't matter. And we cannot predict based on X uh, values of Y. Uh, and we're interested in that. We are not interested in intercept usually. So sometimes you will see, in most cases you will see this P value significant, but it doesn't matter anything really. It just met, uh, means that, yeah, okay. In, if x is zero, y is not zero. Okay, is it interesting? Not really. What is interesting is this line. And if you have only one predictor, p-value, this one, this p-value is the same as this p-value. Uh, okay, what what else you can uh, you can find in the screen? Can I first ask uh, yeah. on? Um, intercept once again. Yes. Because yes. I didn't really get why is it so high because we have even um, smaller uh, estimations for the words that has more than zero 
letters? Uh, can you explain it a bit more? The question. Okay. Um, we expect intercept to give us um, the reaction type in case um, the number of letters is zero. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's some kind of extrapolation because we don't have really uh, uh, words with zero letters. And when we do extrapolation for linear model, it's usually meaningless. We can predict values inside our range of values. If we go outside, we usually make meaningless stuff completely. So, but yeah, it, it yeah, yes. Uh, why it is so small actually why it's uh, so high why it's so big ah, yeah why it's so big sorry yeah because um actually it's very close to uh to the mean and median mm. it's not so different because it's not very it's pretty symmetric uh the distribution so mean and median is rather close to each other it's not perfectly symmetric but well um uh and median is smaller than mean, but just a little bit. Uh, it means that there is some small asymmetry with uh, heavier right tails. Uh, and what it does really mean that intercept is clo close to, to, to mean and median is that actually this predictor, even though it's significant, it not, it's not really, uh, uh, the effect is not really big, not really large. And you can get it, uh, actually, yeah, where, where can you get it, this uh, effect size for the model? Do you remember? From F we even calculated it. Sorry? From T value and F statistics, maybe? Uh, no, no. Uh, the feature of uh, key values and F statistics, they depend on uh, sample size. Mm. Uh, so we have different T distributions for different sample sizes, different F distributions for different uh, group sizes and uh, uh, sample size. And when we talk about effect size, we talk about some, some value that uh, do not systematically change in some direction if we decrease or increase the sample size. Uh, so for example, for uh, effect size for difference between means, we can just use just different difference between means. You know, if you collect higher sample, the difference between two, uh, your estimate of difference uh, between two groups will not change in it will not become higher or lower it will be just more precise if you collect more and more a sample your estimation of the difference between two groups will not grow systematically right the value will be lower in general uh, but uh, the difference between two for example uh, I know difference between uh, centimeters of height in uh, women and men. Uh, if you collect uh, 20 subjects, you'll get some difference, average difference. Uh, and the difference in general will not be higher if you uh, collect uh, 20 millions. Uh, it will be just more precise. The same with uh, all effect sizes. For X effect sizes, we don't want to have uh, some value that changes if we collect uh, more sample. So uh, what we usually use uh, for effect size for linear regression, some very basic thing. We even calculated it during previous seminar. Remember, like uh, residual square, uh, residuals, residual sum of squares, 
total sum of squares. And we try to decide whether we explained most of our sum of squares with our model or it was left unexplained. It looks like you talk about uh, R squared. Yes, exactly. Multiple R squared. Or actually, you can ignore multiple when you actually have simple linear regression. Uh, so just R squared. And do remember minimum and maximum value for R squared. Zero and one. Yes, exactly. Uh, zero means that we, we we really failed in explaining the model, uh, the data, and one means that we explained everything perfectly. And what you can say ba based on this R squared about our model? Looks like we explained four percent of our data mm, no we explained less than uh, it, yes even. actually so really really failed to explain the uh, failed to explain a lot we explained the really very little part uh do you find it strange that we have such small effect but it's still statistically significant How is it possible? Mm. If you think about it, it doesn't seem that they should be dependent on mm. there. Why? Because mm, we can really have really small differences, but it can be significant. The, this difference can be significant still. Actually, yes, but in which situations? I know if we uh, uh, no. Actually, I always have problem with that. I don't understand what's. Uh, that's pretty simple. You just need a uh, really big sample size. If you have small effect, mm. you can find the small effect if you have really big effect, uh, a big sample. So if you have some really small difference in uh, uh, mean uh, height of, uh, um, I don't know, people who or a different, uh, you have very small uh, difference in weight after some diet, uh, but you, you're pretty sure that it exists. It's maybe just 10, 10 grams, but after one week, uh, the difference, but you're pretty sure that it exists. And you just collect really, really big sample size and uh, p-value will be lower than 005 if your sample size is really big. So these three guys are interconnected. Sample size, uh, effect size, and p-value. So with big uh, effect size, uh, you can get small p-value. Uh, I mean, you can catch the effect or uh, uh, in more strict terms, it's called, it's called uh, statistical power. Uh, statistical power uh, is a one minus uh, probability of beta, probability of uh, not finding effect if it really exists. So we usually talk about uh, type one error or alpha error when you get uh, when you get uh, when you decide that there is an effect, but in reality there is no effect. But there is also another important uh, error called type two error, when you don't find the fact, but it really exists. Uh, and statistical power is just opposite to uh, this uh, type two error. So just 
one minus probability of type two error. So if type two error is a probability of a probability of type two error is probability of not catching uh, the effect. Uh, statistical power is a probability of catching the effect. As simple as that. Uh, so in other words, statistical power is a, a probability that you will get uh, statistically significant results if there is real is there is some real effect. Of course, you usually don't know in reality whether you have an effect or not. That's why you test it. Uh, so yeah, uh, assuming that you have really uh, big sample size, uh, you can uh, you have. Uh, uh, high probability of uh, catching uh, uh, the uh, effect, even though the effect is small. Well, otherwise, you have very high effect uh, effect size, but you can get uh, we can find that uh, this effect even on very small sample. For example, uh, if you talk to I know uh, social scientists. Uh, when you ask them what is okay sample size, they say, okay, I'm going to collect 1000 respondents uh, for my uh, master thesis or my PhD thesis. Uh, and I'm pretty happy about that. But 100 respondents, it's, I mean, it's, it's not possible to find anything uh, on this sample size. But if you come to biologist, if you ask him about what is your sample size? Uh, it's six. I mean, six, really? Yes, six rats. I killed them all. I know, I, I mean, they, they talk like that, like that. I mean, my, uh, I mean, I, uh, I know some biologists and they, uh, they really, when they hear about like sample size of 100, they, they laugh because like, they don't have such uh, big sample sizes. Uh, in some fields, even having, uh, I know, 30 subjects, uh, in, in this case, subjects can be like rats or uh, monkeys. Uh, it is very hard to get uh, so much data. Uh, I mean, for them, it's so much data because for every subject, you need to work like several days, for example, or at least several hours. For others, it's just like sending some uh, questionnaire to some random guy in the internet. So, uh, but biologists, they work with some usually uh, um, higher uh, effect sizes. So they work on something that you can really catch easily. Uh, and that's why it's okay for them to work with some small effect size. So, Biological process, processes, they usually more, you know, um, they're more vivid, they're more obvious, they're more uh, substantial than social processes. So there are even meta-analysis that compares effect sizes in different fields. It's actually meta-analysis of meta-analysis. So it's actually even a field of meta-meta-analysis I mean, really, there are some, some scientists there that do meta meta analysis, and it's fun. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, yeah, let's return to our model because we need to also cover multiple linear regression today. So, what is important here is that, yeah, uh, it is significant, but the real effect is very small. How it can be, how it can be. Because it's actually, we have very small effect size. Oh, really big effect size, sorry. Uh, if we check, uh, let's say, Gim. Gim just returns uh, the first value is number of rows, the, uh, the second value is number of calls. 1,452. Uh, Pretty much. 
Uh, so in this sample size, we can find, we can catch in small effects. Okay, uh, now let's try to do some more complicated stuff. And we'll do uh, another predictor. For example, we had uh, written frequency. Written frequency, uh, I mean, the frequency, uh, how frequent uh, this word in the, uh, uh, we, we can even check. I think it's about, uh, they measure how often you can find this word in, uh, some dictionaries or whatever. Let's have a look. A factor, ah, factor, yeah, no, no, no. Written frequency. Where is it? Written frequency. Yeah, numeric vector with log frequency in the Celex lexical database. Um, okay, so yeah. Just frequency, uh, like uh, rareness of the word or popularity of the word. So, what mod model do you expect here? Actually, how can you uh, build a more complicated model? How can you include uh, this written frequency? And what do you think will happen? I mean, what hypothesis can you create on? Written frequencies and uh, reaction time for lexical decisions. Any ideas? It will be the same. I think the most frequent word. Uh, so uh, if um, a person looks at a very frequent word, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, the reaction time will be very uh, small and uh, um, with uh, the low frequency. Maybe even uh, this small word, but uh, with uh, the very low frequency of um, like. Mm. So, so, so if you if if you don't if you do not know if you do not recognize uh, this uh, word, so uh, uh, reaction time uh, will be um, uh, higher. Yeah. So if we have low frequency, we have higher reaction time or lower reaction time. What do you think? Mm, higher, higher reaction time. This higher frequency, this higher frequency. Frequency, you have higher reaction time, right? Mm, do, do I understand this uh, parameter correctly that um, written frequency is about uh, how frequent this word is in the written text? Mm -hmm. Ah, yes, okay. So if uh, it is, uh, if we if there is a very small chance that we will encounter this word in a written text, uh, then uh, our reaction time will be uh, higher. Okay, I think, I think actually vice versa, I think if you have higher frequency uh, of appearance of the word, you have, it's more familiar for you, it's easier to read and uh, the reaction time is lower, but we can check it. Actually, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I did not express uh, my my opinion correctly. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, I I think that if you write a word um, uh, very uh, frequently, even if it is a long word uh, like philosophy, uh, your reaction time will be very small. And if it is like mm. some word that you do not use uh, very often and you mm -hmm. do not write very often that you do not see in the written text. I don't know, like um, chaos mm -hmm. or some term in uh, from physics, um, if you're not a physician. So then your reaction time will be higher because you're not so familiar with uh, the word. Uh, okay, so you, you think that there will be some interaction between actually two uh, predictors and with multiple linear regressions, actually with, I mean, what we, usually called multiple linear regression. We usually do not talk about interactions between predictors. We just suppose that they independently uh, influence some uh, response variable. It doesn't mean actually that they do not interact like, uh, uh, so uh, it doesn't mean that if you apply uh, 
uh, if you apply linear regression on just separate predictors, you will get the same results as uh, if you apply linear regression on two predictors. And you can add another predictor, but by using plus sign. So again, to the right side of the tilde, you have predictors, but now you can add some more predictor and you get, uh, you, you, you uh, uh, set additional predictors with the plus sign uh, inside the lamp function. And let's have, a, let's have a look what we will get. Just uh, let's start just LM function and you'll get um, something. Uh, yeah, we have some negative actually influence. So I think at least, and let's see. So actually when we do, uh, when we add some additional predictors, it doesn't really change us a lot. You just have additional uh, line for this additional predictor. And now uh, you have a p-value for not some specific predictor, but for the whole model. Uh, so null hypothesis for this p-value is that you don't have, uh, or otherwise p-value for uh, this p-value is for null hypothesis that uh, actually, none of these predictors has influence uh, on uh, this reaction time. Uh, so you have like different predictors uh, and different uh, estimates for the uh, for the slope and different p values. Uh, what can really happen, and that's interesting, that uh, Remember uh, the p-value that we had here. It was something like that. And now we add some additional uh, predictor and it changed a bit. So it became a bit more significant and that's pretty strange, but it's, uh, it's reality because uh, uh, when you have several predictors, uh, they like somewhat compete for uh, explaining the same variance. So uh, they, uh, if they uh, correlate to each other, uh, and I think we can check and they will correlate a bit. Uh, uh, if two predictors correlate, correlate to each other, they, uh, compete for explaining the same amount of variance. And if this is the case, even some small variations uh, in the data can influence estimation of this uh, coefficients and p-value and therefore p-value. So uh, when we talk about uh, multiple linear regression, it's important to uh, understand whether uh, your predictors are correlated to each other. Because if they're very correlated, it's sometimes it's better to exclude some predictor. For example, if you have something like a correlation between two variables, like 0 0.97, it's sometimes just uh, different measurements of the one variable. So you measure, for example, uh, I don't know, not uh, in one case, you, you, you measure number of uh, syllables in the word. In another uh, variable, you measure uh, number of letters in the word. And they will be very correlated. And in this case, if the predictors are very correlated, you just the simple, the most simple way is just to exclude one predictor. And in this case, you can even check if they're really correlated. Uh, the overall model will not really be worse uh, because actually they explain the same amount of variance if they, if they were correlated. Uh, another thing that is important when we uh, talk about multiple la linear regression uh, is adjusted R squared. 
uh, if you remember, we uh, previous, uh, previous, uh, during previous seminar, we just ignored the suggested R squared. Uh, but that's pretty important thing. Uh, the idea of adjusted R squared is just something like a punishment of uh, original multiple R squared for uh, additional parameters. So uh, you, uh, your R, adjusted R squared will be always uh, somewhat smaller than multiple R squared. And this difference will be higher with bigger number of uh, predictors. It's an interesting question, why do we ever need this punishment? Uh, so uh, the reason is pretty fundamental. Uh, and also it's about uh, actually what you, you may know from machine learning courses or machine learning uh, terminology as overfitting. Uh, so uh, let me draw you something. Imagine some dots. Okay, and what do you think, what will be the best model to explain this data? Just give some, just you try. What do you think? Just to see the correlation, correlation. I mean, so, I mean, yeah, just, uh, I mean, correlation or as you know, linear, simple linear regression is the same thing as a correlation coefficient, basically. So you can just draw a straight line. Uh, I think I think I will draw, can I draw, I mean, really straight line. Yeah, something like that. And of course, yeah, it will be better if we not just draw a straight line and just randomly, but if we fit, our straight line, uh, 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 the way that uh, uh, residuals from the dot to this line are, mi are minimal. Uh, but if you uh, want to explain even more, if you try to do even better model, in some, in some uh, points you need to stop, but uh, in, uh, if you try to, 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 to have even more, you can uh, create something like that. Some very complicated, if you, for example, if you add to linear regression predictors with uh, uh, squares, the third degrees, the fourth degrees and so on. And you'll get something like this. Yeah, so is this model better or worse than previous one? What do you think? It is more correct, but uh, for some purposes, it could be worse uh, if uh, we are interested in some simple correlation. But we, uh, if we're interested in something very precise, so maybe it is mm -hmm. better. Uh, in which cases it will be better, in which cases it will be worse? I mean, what proposes it can not fit? Okay, uh, I would ask you a very precise question. Do you, um, uh, do you believe predictions uh, do you believe more predictions of uh, the red model or the blue model? For for example, uh, let's but, say. Um, 
but the red model does not predict anything. It seems it just uh, connects the dots and uh, no. But you uh, can we, you can you can use this model for prediction too. But uh, we um, we cannot say where it will go further because with the no, no, no. line it, it is very. It, it actually we can we can uh, we can get a function uh, that will uh, it is not just drawing lines just a complicated function uh, with many polynomials that can actually uh, can draw this complicated uh, line but there will be a mathematical function for that and you can predict for every value uh, on the x what will be a value on the y according to this model. You can do that. You definitely can do that. Okay, maybe so, I, I just uh, did not learn uh, such uh, such complicated functions that I could predict. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, but uh, so they're equal then. Uh, I don't know. I believe more this simple model, actually. So if I have a new uh, I don't have many dots here, but I think it's more or less clear that, yeah, there is something like, actually, it's more likely, we don't know actually, but it's more likely that in this case, uh, we have something more like uh, actually straight relationship and some extra noise. Of course, it's noise, something uh, comes from, it's not just, you know, random noise in the universe. Uh, just some other variables that we, we may not have just recorded. Uh, but what we recorded is just y and x. And uh, sometimes just uh, uh, the best way to, to, to build a model, just to build a just a good enough model without trying to uh, build even better model because uh, actually, uh, if we'll add some more complications to the model, even as like additional predictors. Uh, so for example, you can uh, uh, add to this model, I know, uh, whether on Mars, whether on Venera, uh, number of uh, suicides by, uh, um, by, uh, in different countries and somehow add these numbers to the model uh, to linear regression. And what is interesting that it will never spoil your model in terms of R squared. So for example, if you add some random, uh, just if you even uh, generate uh, some random numbers, uh, let's say, uh, subset, mutate, uh, rend one to our norm. Uh, let's say uh, how much we have. Uh, two, rend two, L norm. I would say error norm. Oh, I have some new message. Uh, yeah. Okay, and let's use this data set instead. Mm -hmm. This data set instead. And let's have a look. And add this random and I forgot somewhere called in bracket, but I don't know where. Hmm. Uh, 
Yep. Oh. They're not significant. They're not significant. But R squared became even higher than it was. Let's compare. I mean, it's not really that much higher, but it became a bit more, uh, I mean, this R squared is higher than this R squared. And uh, if we just want to decide based on R squared, we will decide that this model with just random variables is actually better than the model without random variables. But the problem is that uh, if we just catch some random noise in the data, it is a bad a model because when we uh, try to predict with this model, we will predict the worse uh, than if we try to predict with a simple model. So it's the problem of uh, overfitting when you uh, overlearn, overfit your model on some noise. And when you do another data set, the model will behave worse. So uh, in this case, uh, it means that you want to explain what you can explain, but you want to touch unexplained what you cannot really explain. And you don't need to think about explaining unexplainable, you know. Uh, there is some unreducible noise in your model that uh, in your data that you cannot explain. If you have like uh, even so many variables, uh, you cannot uh, delete the subject from them because all these columns, uh, they're measured on like, uh, words and even humans. And humans are, well, they're not really that simply. Yeah, I don't, do not say that they are totally unpredictable and so on, but they're complicated. They're much more complicated than simple, simple model with one X and Y. Um, and you have many uh, individual differences. You have many, uh, I know, mood and uh, even spontaneous uh, thoughts in your head that all can influence your dependent variable and you cannot measure it all. What you need, you need to specify your hypothesis uh, and just leave with this uncertainty that you will never explain all uh, noise in your model. So uh, that's why uh, the simple model is better than more complicated. Is better than more complicated model. Uh, and that's why there are different ways, different measurements that try to punish you on using additional parameters. So if you use additional predictors, you have lower score. So uh, the scores, they combine like uh, uh, quality of the model in terms of uh, how to explain your data, how it fits your data, and on number of predictors. And one of the most simple ways to do that is adjusted R squared. Uh, there is a very simple, mo uh, simple uh, actually, uh, multiple uh, squared formula for that. I mean, it's really that simple. Uh, where's Wikipedia? Wikipedia. Huh? I guess the third squared. Or if that's a inflation of uh, R squared. Uh, 
Yeah, this one. So it just uh, actually n means number of measurements and e number of parameters. And you can even check in your head or even with the pencil that uh, this value, uh, the higher number of parameters, uh, the higher uh, the punishment in your model. Uh, so it can even be negative in some rare cases when you have really bad model and many parameters, uh, but it's more likely an artifact. Uh, but you can find it. For example, you have really model that explain nothing and you have many parameters. In this case, you can find negative adjustment error square. So you can see that uh, after adding this additional two random predictors that has no additional information about the data, right? They're just random numbers. Uh, multiple R squared is better than for more simple model, but adjusted R squared is less than for more simple model. Does it make sense? But it's complicated concept that you need as simple model as possible. And it really, like, uh, it's really important not in terms of, uh, not only in statistical terms, but also in theoretical terms, like uh, uh, Akama's razor, uh, Akama's principle. Uh, it's basically this principle here, but uh, formulated in statistical, statistical way. And if you do not follow this principle, you will get some real artifacts. Uh, so in general, you want to keep your model as simple as possible and your theory as simple as possible and your experiment as simple as possible. Because simplicity means intelligence and clear thinking. So that's all for, to, for today. If you have any question, I can answer. But basically, that's all. So see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.